that is in this country usually forget covid uh twice a year there's a senior nationals for 18 to 24 year olds and then masters 25 and over and i know quite a few people on the call have had the, the pleasure of swimming at those events now when you go to those events what you find very very quickly is that everyone's there that is there because they want to be there it's a choice they are there whether they train one hour a week or whether they train 20 hours a week and it is a range you know i've been to those events where there's olympic athletes at one end of the spectrum and somebody in board shorts doing head up breaststroke at the other you know it's just a, and i'm being obviously joking there but you know it's a good range of athletes and a, it was fun really really good fun and that became a central part as to my journey back into the sport at 21 i had the opportunity to go to university and swim in hertfordshire some of you have probably raced at that pool in hatfield and um, the university pool there so i studied there for four years and met one of the swimmers that's actually on the call today and i got an opportunity in 2011 which was going to be my last year of university to split my last year in half and train full-time as a training partner for the london olympics which was an amazing experience. Uh, got to obviously travel around, do some really cool things, go to press events and stuff like that. Uh, and at the end of the um, at the end of the training season, literally about two weeks before the Olympic Games, the, the swimmer at the time, Adam, who I was training with, gave me one ticket and said, thank you for everything you've done for me this year. This is a ticket to come and watch me at the Olympic Games. And it was the most incredible experience of my life. Luckily, and it was a luckily, that night was the night that Becky Adlington won her bronze medal. It was also the night Michael Phelps won his gold in the 100 fly. Um, and I've just put a few photos up there. The weird photo of Boris Johnson's head is because he was sitting two seats along from me. At that time, he was the London mayor and just plonked himself in with the crowd. Uh, but it was a really odd encounter. Um, but that changed everything for me. The, the, the experience and the photo at the bottom there, there was a million people in the park that day that I went. And I think at that point, I was like, wow, sport's so much bigger than this. I met these people from all around the world and it completely opened my eyes. And it wasn't about necessarily you know, medals and goals and targets and all of that. It was the whole experience of it. It was absolutely wonderful. Um, I then obviously did my dissertation at university, finished that and transitioned into coaching. And that was kind of the next stage of my journey and where I met quite a few of the people again on the call today from a coaching point of view. Uh, I got to go and actually coach a university team. So I went to Bucks, which I know some of the swimmers at the club here do. Amazing event, amazing experience. Uh, Arena League, which I'm sure all of us really, really enjoy. Got the chance to go to the final a few times, which is quite cool. Uh, one of you mentioned earlier about travel. Uh, the, where I've read Carifta there, that was the Caribbean Games. So I was fortunate enough to coach a few swimmers that swam for countries from the Caribbean, but lived in this country. Uh, got to go out to a competition in the Caribbean, which was really, really cool. Uh, and ultimately watch all of the, those three athletes go on and compete internationally, which was an amazing experience. It came with huge challenges. And I think until you've been in the coaching world, you, you, know, you not, don't necessarily appreciate all of the challenges that coaches have. And you have some incredible highs you know, I know Cambridge have made some massive arena events over the last couple of years, some great results at nationals and things like that. And you get some wonderful highs. But on the flip side of that, you have some massive lows. And I think the last 12 months has, has shown everybody that. And I'm very thankful, actually, that I'm not coaching now because it's a very difficult situation. And uh, I take my hat off to all the coaches at your club and everywhere else because they're doing a great job. And, and what, what happened from that part of my journey was I learned a lot. The photo at the top there is the London to Brighton bike ride. It was a 100 kilometer cycle that I did. Uh, if we actually left Hertfordshire, cycled into London to the start line and then went down to Brighton. And two of the people in that photo are swimming parents. And then one of them at the time was the head coach at Hatfields. And it was just a, a great group of mates. Uh, and th one of the things that came out of swimming when often you speak to people is they talk about, did you compete at this level or did you compete at that level? And these are the things that I pull out. I say, well, these, these are the memories. These are the things that stay with you for life. And I think, again, when I talk about the podcast, it's the journey these people go on. They don't very often talk about their achievements. They talk about very much the actual journey and the experiences that they have along the way. Moved into my current role, which a lot of you probably know me from, um, or quite a few of you would have come across. And I've got to do a huge range of activities. I had 125 clubs, 10,000 swimmers, 20,000 parents, uh, 300 coaches plus that I was supporting and got exposure to what the governing body looked like. And for, for anyone who doesn't know what a governing body is, that's Swim England, or it used to be called the ASA. And I got a much better understanding of the system. You know, just as a, a number for you guys, just in swimmers alone, there are 70,000 swimmers in this country. If you add members, as in terms of coaches, officials and everything else, it's close to 200,000 people just in England that are involved in swimming. 
Okay, so it's a much bigger picture than perhaps the world that we get in our little club bubbles. And I had to learn that and understand that. Understand that one thing that you did when you're supporting 125 clubs has an impact on a huge amount of people. And again, something that came out of the podcast was people who were in positions where they may be talking to 100,000 people or a million people on TV. And something they said or did would have a huge impact and both positively and negatively. Um, and then the exposure to politics, which uh, for any of you who have not come across that, when you work at sport in, in any level, you will eventually have to deal with politics. And that, that's been a massive aspect to, of my role. And then the podcast, which is what I'm here to, to, talk to, to talk to you about today. And I think that this has been a fascinating thing for me. I started it because I just wanted to share stories. Um, it really was just sharing stories. When I went to the London Olympics and got to watch that night of racing, the 50 freestyle that night was run won by Florent Manady. And I've still got the photo of the, the time up on the board. And it was, oh, my God, he's a huge guy, did this amazing racing. Um, and I was like, what must that be like to be that person and to, to coach that person and to be around that person? And a few years later, I was fortunate enough to meet his coach at the time, uh, Roman we had about an hour talking uh, at a conference and it was fascinating to suddenly get that insight. And as I moved through kind of this part of these experiences, I suddenly went, I'd love to share more of these stories. Now, maybe 10 years ago, that would have been a lot harder to do. And I'm sure there was some super techie people that would have said, I can do this, I can do that. But actually, I didn't have that expertise. Now, as nowadays with things like YouTube and stuff like that, how to run a podcast in YouTube and within an hour you've learned how to do it and off you go so there's it's suddenly a lot easier to share stories and I just want to talk you through the photos that I've kind of put up there because these were kind of two two things at the top that really stuck out for me Nick who is the most recent episode that I put out last week it's a great interview on YouTube uh, and without spoiling it too much he had some massive challenges in his life to overcome uh, over a 10-year period he had to raise 30 million pounds to get his business off the ground um, and it opened five months before COVID launched. So that would be a huge challenge in itself. But exactly a year ago on Monday, just gone, he then had eight strokes in two hours and had to come back from that as well. And that photo was taken after he, in, in the summer after he had made his recovery. So it's a very humbling interview that talks about the journey of sport and the value of it, much more than, I say, outcomes and things we talk about. Um, the young lady up on the right is the first episode of the season that I've put out this year, a girl called Sarah. And I put that up there because we swam together when we were 10 years old. Uh, we started our swimming journey together. We started at the same club. And she went on a journey in her late teens around the world. And she ended up building a network of three quarters of a million scuba divers from around the world, um, specifically in the area of female scuba diving, because there wasn't a support system in place for them. And it was fascinating to reconnect with her and again, share these journeys that we've been on. Any of you don't recognize in the middle, uh, the long, young lady laughing her head off is Lucy. She was, uh, I think, episode 15 of the podcast. Lucy Charles, she's uh, an Ironman athlete. Um, again, most people on the call won't know I've known Lucy long before she was a triathlete. And I used to live with her husband sitting next to her. And uh, we were having a catch up when we were recording or preparing to record the podcast. And her little dog, Lola, decided to photobomb the FaceTime call. So I've kept that photo because it, it reminds me of, again, a funny moment that occurred along the way. And then I've got some amazing opportunities to meet some great athletes. So you recognize the picture, picture there with Adam. Uh, and part of the podcast stuff was doing some, I guess, parent education work on the, the Adam PT tour. So again, amazing opportunities, amazing experiences. But I think some of the things that I've listed up there is grown my network. It's grown my understanding of the sports world. It's allowed me to experiment with new ideas, like some of the stuff we've done in the region over the last few years has been quite innovative. And a lot of that's come because we've just been trying new ideas. Um, have quite open conversations and i think again if you if you've got anyone that you admire in your life an idol you know someone you follow on social media whatever it is being able to have that open conversation with them that we do on the podcast you get to know them a little bit more um, and i think back to the conversation between donkey and shrek where he talks about ogres being like onions and that's how i'd regard all of the guests that i've spoken to you spend the first five minutes getting the first layer of onion off and then actually you get to talk so much more about who they are as a person and it's been wonderful. Now, I'm going to um, kind of pull all this together because I want to get onto the real thick of the podcast questions that you've got. And for me, it's why does this journey had such an impact on me? It's fun. And I'm looking back to that list of things that you put out at the start when I asked you why you did your swimming. I enjoy things that are creative. I enjoy things that inspire me. I enjoy being part of a team. 
I love the social aspect of it. I love the friendships that I've made through this journey. The impact it has on people is, is a massive thing uh, and not from a, an ego point of view, but it's really nice to hear when someone gets in touch and said, oh, I listened to that interview and that person really helped me and it's really lifted me up. That's wonderful to hear stuff like that. And I, I talk about goals and I don't mean that and then I want to win this or I want to achieve this number of followers or you know whatever your goals are in life. I talk about goals is that, the, the people that I've got to, um, to have these conversations with have achieved, if you like, something that perhaps a lot of us could only ever dream of. But actually, when you spend some time talking to them, you find out that there's a whole lot more to it than just, oh, you're the Olympic champion or, oh, you're the captain of the Red Arrows or, oh, you captain the rugby team or whatever it is. So I think one of the things is the understanding of what a goal is and what we view it as. So what does this all mean? Well, it's kind of over to you on that front because every single person will have their own things they want to know from this. So what I've done is I've pulled together a sheet here in front of you that's got a photo from all 24 episodes I put out last year, the name, what they do, um, and a quote from the episode but I want Tom to pick up on questions that come in because I really want this to be about you getting the answers hopefully that you're looking for so it is very much over to you whether it's about the podcast or my journey leading up to that it is really in your hands where we go next so if you do have any questions uh send them in uh, and then I might ask you to unmute yourself if you don't want to unmute yourself and ask I'll ask it for you um, so honestly, if you want to know anything about about anything to do with his journey, swimming, anything Kev knows, he's a great source of knowledge. So please, please do take this uh, opportunity. I, I will just start the questions with just a simple one. Uh, what has been, been your biggest challenge on your journey? It could be anything. It doesn't have to be swimming related. And how did you overcome it? A great question um, <clears throat> and I like that because uh, one of the last things that the, the, the comments in the the chat box was from Ross about resilience and I think that's a um, that's something that really sticks by me and the reason I say that is because we all think or the, the way that the world works social media things like that tell us I'm here I want to get to there and it's going to be a nice straight line to get there and you can forget it it's not true. It's a complete illusion. There might be an aspect of the journey, six months, a year, two years that are straight lines, but then there'll be other parts where there's a downhill and then a zigzag and an up and a down and a twist and everything in between. And something that I've learned along the way has really been, you, ha you have to understand that resilience is developed over time, but it develops because you will have these challenges along the way. And it's completely normal everybody has them whether you're one of these wonderful people that i've got on the screen in front of me or just a complete novice at the start of your swimming journey you are going to have challenges along the way biggest challenge for me hmm. i mean i think it's important that i'm as open and honest with everyone on the call as possible and um, where are we now 2021 so in the summer of 2019 um i lost one of my parents and i think that was one of the biggest things that's that's influenced my journey it was the catalyst to quite a few things of me moving on and doing quite a few different projects since then. And I think one of the, the reason I say that is because it changes everything. Uh, it changes your perspective on what matters, what's important. Uh, and one of the things I listed out a few lessons, just kind of looking across this photo wall of things that stuck out for me. And every single one of them talked about this fact that they had a passion. They believed in what they did. They loved what they did. And I think that that moment of understanding that your time is limited you know however long we've got actually are you spending 40 hours a week in a job or are you spending 10 hours a week in the pool or on a tennis court or on a basketball pitch or in a classroom or whatever it is you want to do that you love do you enjoy it does it excite you does it make you want to get out of bed in the morning and I think if the answer is no, I would be asking what route you're on. Are you trying to get somewhere where you are going to have a great time? Because I think we, we, we've we really got to make sure that we, we have a level of happiness in us. And that comes from what we do day to day. It's going to be different for everybody and what makes them tick and what they enjoy. But I think that's probably the biggest challenge and hurdle that I've had to overcome was, was losing a parent and actually realizing, wow, you've really got to make sure that you're enjoying yourself and getting the most out of the time you have got. Um, because it suddenly reminds you that it is limited. Um, I've not seen any other questions coming yet. Oh, there's the first one. Ah, 
<laughs> I've, I've got a couple. I've got one from um, Sophia. I think she got there first. Ah. She, um, she wants to know, was, was your journey ever scary? Like, was there any parts where you were a bit scared? Terrifying. Plenty of times when it was absolutely terrifying. I remember the the first day for anyone who's who's been to university. Um, when you leave it and you go and get a proper job in the real world, um, that first day when suddenly you're not in a nice little secure bubble anymore, it's it's just a challenge. Um, when I decided to step out of coaching and move towards what I'm doing now, that was a challenge, and it was kind of like, oh, I'm not sure I'm comfortable with this. But actually, one of the things that I picked up, especially from, I think it was episode 18 of the podcast with Jake. He talked a lot about being comfortable with being uncomfortable, um, really like being comfortable with it. And I'm, I'm not saying that it's, you know, swimming is uncomfortable. We all know that. Um, but, you know, it's, it's part of what we do. It's why it's, we appreciate it so much when it goes well. So I think, um, yeah, I don't know if that gets, gets to the heart of what we were looking for there. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's, yeah, that's exactly what one I know. Um, got one from Catherine. Um, she wants to know what advice would you give to swimmers to focus on when they get back into the pool, feel unfit, um, and just try finding things difficult. Um, I think I would loop back to my why. So I'm going to pick the social or friendly aspect of it because I think there's always going to be something that's a challenge. Um, I'll give an example of someone like Adam Peaty. If he turns up to training, whether it's a week before the Olympics or whether it's now when I know he's in really heavy training, there's always going to be things he wants to work on and develop. So there's nothing wrong with getting back in the pool and going, oh, I don't feel fit. I don't feel strong. I don't feel fast, whatever it is. But if my why is because I enjoy seeing my friends and let's say we're back in in a month's time or whenever it is, and we've had 12 months of not seeing our friends, then actually the biggest win I'm going to get in March, April, May, June, and July is that actually I get to see my friends again. And that's why I swim. So I think it's again, really important to understand like your why, because when you get back in the water, there's going to be plenty of distractions going, Oh, where are you ranked? Or when are you going to qualify for this or whatever it is? It doesn't matter. It really doesn't for that, for the next six, however long it takes us to get back to normal, if we can call it, if it'll ever be normal again, um, will actually be, you know, are you enjoying yourself? Are you having fun? Are you, are you back? Are you back in the water? You know, I've been speaking to friends all around the world recently who are telling me in various stages what they're doing and what they're not doing. And, uh, you know, let's first and foremost get, get back in the pool. Uh, and then beyond that, everything else is a bonus. Super. Um, Luke, do you want to ask your question? Do you want to unmute yourself and ask Kev? Uh, yeah. Um, so you started off talking about what you're, you under, you're underachieve in, your, in the first year and over overachieving in 10, or the, I think it was the other way around. I can't remember. What, what would you say your, um, your goals are for the next year and then the next 10 with the podcast? And then um, also what's next for you? <laughs> That's a great question, Luke. Thank you. And um, I think uh, a couple of things there. Obviously, the first thing, where am I going to see the podcast going in the next year? Well, by the end of two weeks' time, I'd have probably recorded all the content for this year. Um, one of my reframing things in my head was I'm not going to sit on the 4th of January and get told everything's locked down again and spend the whole of January in a bit of a funk and not really feel like I'm doing anything because um, it was really easy to do that. Um, especially with a lot of the challenges we've all had. So I contacted within the first week of lockdown as many people as possible that I wanted to record with this year. And I'm recording about three episodes a week at the moment, recorded one today, uh, recorded one on Wednesday, recorded one on Monday. So I think that the, the, for this year, it's actually just navigate my way out of it in terms of the, the lockdown and the pandemic and, and try and support my, my friends and family around me to do the same because, hey, we're all in the same boat here. I think my goal in terms of the podcast for probably the next 10 years, wow. I mean, who knows where it's going to go next? What I would say is some of the opportunities that have come out of the discussions I've had, I could never have anticipated. And I'd love to think that some of those opportunities continue to come up. So some of the content I'm recording at the moment, um, give you a great example. Uh, the podcast I recorded this morning was with a mental health app. So mental health is obviously a huge area. Uh, it has been for many years, but it's really starting to come to the forefront of people's minds, whether it's 
works in sport, business, schools, whatever it is. Um, and a really exciting opportunity that's come out of the podcast recording is that I'm looking to potentially go into support swimming clubs and other sports teams in better supporting the mental health of young athletes. Now, that's hugely exciting. So within 10 years, you know, even if I visited one club a year with 100 athletes, by the time I get to year 10, that's, you know, over a thousand people that I've had a hopefully a positive impact on their mental health. So I guess the exciting thing is I'm not sure where it's going to go in the next 10 years, but I'm, I'm sure there's some things coming up uh, in terms of what next for me. Uh, who knows? Um, I almost like it that way. I almost like the not knowing aspect. One of the things the lockdowns taught us is we can't control what's going to happen next week, next month, even next year. But actually, I can control what I'm going to do today, what I'm going to do, you know, tomorrow. So I'll have a little list of things I want to try and do or podcasts I want to record, books I want to listen to. I'm doing a university bit of work at the moment. So I think that's probably what's next for me is actually just living a little bit more in the moment and not stressing too much about what's coming up because, you know, next week will take care of itself and last week I can't do anything about. Super. Um, Matilda, do you want to ask your question? Who's your biggest inspiration and why? Great question. Um, oh, that's a tough one, Matilda. Um, I'm going to have to pick a few, um, and that's not me sidestepping it, but I think there's different people in different aspects of my life. Um, and I'm not going to try, I'm not going to embarrass him too much, <clears throat> but you've got Liam on the call, um, whose features in episode four of the podcast. And <clears throat> I think it's very easy in the sport you know, in swimming, whatever sport you're involved in, to get a bit caught up in sport and forget about life. And I think something that I've learned from, from speaking to Liam and, and a few others that have had some really difficult situations, Nick, who I mentioned in my most recent episode, uh, Katie in episode nine, um, who, you know, three days out from her major moment in Olympics, nearly had a serious accident and took 12 months to get over that. You know, I, I've crossed paths with quite a few people who have had some real near misses, um, in life and I think once you experience that you learn to step back a little bit and keep perspective on things um, in terms of my actual inspiration I guess as a person there's a couple in sport that stick out for me uh, Michael Jordan when I was younger I used to play basketball um, and having watched the last dance this summer which I'm sure quite a few of you got to watch or last summer I should say that was awesome really big inspiration huge drive huge passion for what he does um, I really enjoy working with Adam um, and I wouldn't say so much as an idol, um, but as the best swimmer in this country and the aspirations he has to change the sport, I think it's really exciting and it inspires me that there's athletes out there that despite putting every ounce of effort they've got into winning an Olympic gold, still have time to try and change many other things in the world. So I guess that's, that's a few, um, but that was a great question, Matilda. Thank you. And I, I wrestle with that one because I think there is, uh, we all have different influences and idols that we look up to. Um, but I think I've been very fortunate to have quite a few wonderful ones. Uh, next is Macy's question. If you want to unmute yourself, you can ask that one. Um, what are your best tips or like techniques for keeping motivated, especially in lockdown, but like in general, when you have a bad race or you have a bad time? Okay, so a two-part question there, and great question there, Macy. So the first one, we're talking about lockdown and keeping motivated. Well, what I would do is one of the things that you, you all did at the start was you wrote three words, phrases, whatever it was down, that were your why, that why you're involved in the sport of swimming. So if, for example, yours was you're competitive, you enjoy seeing your friends, and you enjoy keeping fit and healthy. Well, in terms of keeping motivated, if you know that's what drives you in the pool, that's what can drive you through lockdown. So if those are the three things we're going to pick on, let's find something I can do each week that's competitive, whether it's a digital game, whether it's a running challenge, cycling challenge, step counts, whatever it is. Second thing, seeing my friends, I'm going to make sure every single week I schedule time to catch up with my friends, FaceTime, WhatsApp video call, Zoom, Teams, whatever it is, you know, because I know that's a really important part of me. And fitness if you guys are used to training four, five, six times a week, whatever it is, 
make sure four or five or six times a week you're getting up and doing something it doesn't have to be swimming because at the moment it can't be swimming but it could be doing a joe wicks class it could be going for a walk it could be going for a run but if you actually prioritize your week around you know the things that already motivate you and as i said at the start we've kind of identified some of those things that's a really really good way of getting through this period because then at the end of the month if i've had three check-ins with my friends every week 12 times during the month i've had a social activity involving my friends and actually that's as important for me as you know the fitness and every other aspect mm. second thing i guess more once we're back to normal if you have a bad race or miss out on a cut time uh first things first take a big breath take a pause and go and swim down and the reason i say that is because emotion plays such a huge part in our response to things just by going and swimming down and having a drink it's gonna calm you down a little bit get hydrated have a snack and then sit down and go right let's let's take a breath and see where i am and i think it's that that's probably the first thing i would say the second thing is actually to analyze what's happened as much as you can and i'm not saying get over analytical but if my coach was tom and i wanted to go two minutes for 200 freestyle and i went 201 and i spoke to tom and tom said kev this time last year you were going 210 and I know you wanted to break two minutes, but actually you've improved by nine seconds this year. You've worked really hard in training. You've done everything I asked. Great job. All right, let's, let's take a positive spin on that. Uh, there's always going to be something we can find that we didn't do well. And even when I've worked, I had the pleasure of working with Olympic athletes, even if they win, and I've found an interview with Michael Phelps saying that he's won gold and broke the world record and he's still not happy with the race because he's always trying to improve. So if you focus solely on the things that you're going to improve on you're always going to feel like oh that was a horrible race whereas actually there's always going to be some positives you can take away from that so i think one of the best piece of advice there is take a pause take a breath go and have your swim down or you're stretching off or whatever it is have a drink and a snack and then actually let's find one positive and one development area that we can take from a race and i think that's a really balanced way of looking forwards thanks macy that was a very good question uh next is catherine uh yeah catherine are you gonna unmute yourself or I, i'm happy to, to answer that one um, straight off but you kind of possibly already sort of answered it a little bit with <clears throat> this question uh, my question was was there a podcast that really resonated with you so it was really meaningful really touched you um I, i'm gonna again i'll be brutally open and honest with everyone because i think we we see a very filtered life on social media and i think it's important i share some of these things with you so nick the episode that i put out this week on the podcast um one we didn't record this bit um, but one of the stories behind nick in 2010 he had 500 pounds in his bank account and his dad died from cancer horrible story and he sat up and said i'm going to go and make a difference i'm going to do something that's going to change the world for many people and off he went. And 10 years later, he's raised 30 million. He's created a social project that really is changing lives of thousands of people. He's the director of, of British Surfing and England Surfing. And he's having a massive impact. And off air when we finished recording, and I hadn't told him this before we start. And I said, well, actually, Nick, because we recorded this back end of last year. I said, just over a year ago, I lost my dad. And I decided I was going to go off and try and do things that I thought were going to make you proud and give me fulfillment in life and give me the, the most satisfaction out of the time I've got. And I said, I see myself in you in 10 years time. And he got quite choked up about it, but it was a really nice moment. And that was one of the ones that resonated the most with me, I guess, because in this period of lockdown, we've all been a bit more reflective about what matters, what we enjoy. Um, but hey, every single person on this call, there are moments, there are stories, there are quotes from them that I think, oh, that's really, I, I can relate to that. Uh, but then there's other parts that are completely in another world. You know, one of the things I asked Andy, the fighter pilot in episode 16, what's it like breaking the speed of sound? Because I'm never going to get that opportunity. What's it like flying a Spitfire? You know, never going to get that opportunity. So there's been a nice balance, I guess, from the, the bits that resonate with me, but then also the eye opening of the bits that I can't relate to, but they've managed to, to, to share with me. So I hope that answers your question. Awesome. Uh, Ross, do you want to unmute yourself and ask a question? Yeah. Um, what is your favourite sports quote? Oh, that's a, that's a big question. Um, cool, that is a really good question. Um, it's not actually from my show. Um, <clears throat> it's um, 
It's from, uh, someone's going to be able to help me here, the Olympic sailor who's got five goals, Ben Ainsley. There we go. It's jumped into my head. Um, it was a, the, a podcast called The High Performance Podcast, which is won by Damien Hughes, who was on my show, episode 13, and Jake Humphrey, which was episode 18. And they interviewed somebody who you know, is quite a brutal sport sailing in terms of you know, the challenges and the physicality of the environment. And the story just just resonated with me quite well. And at the end, they said, if you've got one message for everyone out there, what would it be? And he looked at the camera and went, never give up, ever. Whatever happens, don't give up. And that stuck with me. Um, it, it became kind of a real mantra for me that I, I'd never take anything on the nose and say, it can't be done. I'd say, it can't be done yet. I'm going to go over here and we're going to try it a different way and we're going to make it work. And I think for young athletes out there that are chasing counties, regionals, nationals, whatever it is you're looking for out of the sport, there is always a way. Uh, I swam my first nationals at the age of 12. Um, I stopped swimming when I was 15 and I came back in at 21 and made Olympic trials at 24. And I tell you what, I enjoyed it a lot more when I was a little bit older because I'd, ha I'd had to work so hard to get to that point. And I hadn't given up per se. I came back and made that choice that, no, I'm not done yet. I'm not stopping. I'm going to keep going. And I think that was, that was something that's made me really enjoy it. So never give up. But thanks, Ross. That was a great question. I think it was Liam. Liam was next. Yeah, come on, Liam. Let's, let's hear from you. Hi, Kevin. Um, the question I had for you, Kevin, was uh, given that you've interviewed quite a lot of people at the top of their field um, and the best at what they do, particularly someone like Adam Peaty, um, what makes someone like them the best at what they do? What are the key traits? And anything you can shed light on PT would, would be brilliant. Okay. Um, one thing I've noticed about the extraordinary achievements of the people that I interview uh, and I, I can kind of share more on Adam because I do know him pretty well now, is that they are not extraordinary people, as in they're not superhuman. They have arms and legs. They talk. They eat. They sleep. They train. They have to earn money. They, you know, they, they live. They're, they're just like us. And every single time you meet somebody who is in on another planet if you like in terms of your your view of them the more i realize how normal they are the stresses they have in their life and everything else so i think that's the first thing to say out there they are not different in many respects to us but you talk about the traits and the attributes and adam certainly embodies these but i think there's pretty much everyone i interviewed will talk about these firstly they're all on a journey so they the, this notion of yet um, Adam Peaty went to the European juniors when he was 18, his shorts ripped and he came sixth, I believe. Okay. That was not in his eyes a success. Um, he ended up breaking down in tears and crying to his coach and said, I'm done this. I, I don't want, and she said, we're not there yet. Keep going, keep plowing on. Um, and that was, you know, he's got to where he's got to. The second thing is that we all have hurdles. Every single one along the way is going to have a challenge to deal with. Uh, and some of them are, uh, like yourself included, uh, are a lot more than others. So I think understand that everyone, doesn't matter where you are on your journey or what level you aspire to get to, is going to have hurdles. They all have a passion for what they do. And I think that the discussion we had, you know, when we were recording, you know, there's this passion for swimming, the love of it coming through. And Adam has that. Oh my God, you go and spend some time with him and you see him away from the pool and you see it even more, you know, he's like, Oh my God, have you seen this news? And he's on swim swam and he's on Twitter watching this and he's on that. And he's keeping eye on what's going on in the sports world. He loves knowing his swimming. They've all shown patience. Um, and I, I that's going to come out more in season five. I, I had a lovely conversation this week with a woman called Kath Bishop, um, who wrote a wonderful book called, um, uh, it was about winning. It was a concept around winning and the long win. And she went to the Olympics and came, I believe, sixth. She went to the Olympics again four years later and came ninth. And then she retired. And then she came back two years before her final Olympics and ended up with a silver medal rowing with Catherine Granger, currently the chair of UK Sport. And we're having a conversation this week and we're recording a podcast next week. And she was saying, having that patience, 
to ultimately achieve not just what you want in sport, but what you want in life. That was what her journey had taught her. So that was something that that came out for me. And then the final thing is kind of what I started with was that you could never have predicted where this was going. And I think Phelps talked about that. Never put a limit on anything. Just because you can dream it doesn't mean you can't go further than that. Just because you set the bar at whatever it is doesn't mean you will go beyond that. Because if that was the case, I think a lot of people who broke world records or won Olympic titles would just stop immediately. And actually, you very often see some of these what I'd call really successful people. They get to one level and then they do something even more crazy and they do something even more crazy. Like, how did you do that? And they said, well, as soon as I did that, I suddenly believed that I could do that. So I think this kind of not understanding how far it could go and being okay with that. But that was a great question. Thank you very much. I think James has got a question. I think he's going to ask it. Yes, Kev. Uh, just to follow up on, uh, on Liam's question, really. Um, just obviously, you've had awesome opportunities to, uh, to work and interview uh, some hugely successful professionals in their field, and obviously working with Adam Peaty. Um, has your outlook on sort of high performance changed uh, and what you need to have or develop to achieve it? Um, <clears throat> I mean, on top of the few things I've mentioned already, um, I think being present, uh, and I've mentioned that as one of my learnings so far, <clears throat> enjoying the moment. And I think very often we can get, you get a bit too carried away with what's coming up. And I think one of the things, <clears throat> if we take Adam as an example, if he's got 100% of his brain focused on what's going to happen this summer, he's not listening to what his coach is saying in the session now. If he's got his brain 100% focused on this summer, when he gets home and his kid needs a cuddle um, because you know, Adam's got a little boy now, he's not fully present as a dad. And I think something I've learned around Adam, but as with others that I know kind of quite personally, there is a level of when I'm working or doing my job or training or whatever it is, I'm 100% on it. But when I'm not, I'm present in whatever else I'm doing. And I listened to a fascinating article or listened to a fascinating interview of Johnny Wilkinson talking about the same thing, about being present as a dad and as an athlete and as a coach and as a, as a speaker. Um, I guess the second thing is around keeping things in perspective, which is very difficult when you're highly driven. Um, but actually, it, it manages the lows better and the highs when you can keep things in perspective. And I think the one of the other things is that... <clears throat> Everyone will have uh, physical limitations, okay? You're all going to grow to a certain height. You're all going to have a certain wingspan, you know, whatever it is. The people I have met have not been limited by what they physically have, none of them, even the, the athletes amongst it. The, 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 the situation they found themselves in, whether it's where they've grown up, um, you know, what uh, level of finance they've been born into, um, what school they've went to, uh, what coach they've had, all of those sorts of things. There's been a, a level of, um, it's come from them, who they are as a person. It's not the, the say, the, the God-given characteristics, if you like. Um, you know, Phelps is not the tallest swimmer in the world. Adam is certainly not the tallest swimmer in the world. Hasn't stopped them going on and doing incredible things. So I, I think that's probably one of the things that's really changed my view on high, not changed it, uh, solidified, I guess, my view on high performance that actually some of the most incredible athletes and people that I've come across, it is who they are as the person that's made them incredible and allowed them to achieve the things they have, not something they were naturally given. I hope that answers your question, James. Yeah, good one. Like that. <clears throat> uh, we've got another one from Sophia. She would like to know what you do to relax your mind. Like, I don't know whether you're preparing for a race or preparing for some work or something, but what do you do to relax your mind? Have you got any tips surrounding that? I've got two. Uh, number one is make sure, I mean, this is for me, is that I physically do something every day, whether that's exercise, go for a walk, you know, but get up and do something every day. That's, and I'm talking during lockdown here, that's been my go-to because that's that's filled the gap, if you like, of sport and the gym and swimming and everything else. I guess the, the other thing is in terms of like keeping mindfulness, I find, um, I guess, a level of escapism uh, in the surfing that I've done and the trips that I've been on. Um, and that's been, that's been fascinating. Like some of the experiences I've had stepping away from the structured life and having a, a trip here or a trip there or short holidays or whatever it is, um, that I've had some of the most incredible moments in my life 
doing that. Um, so yeah, I, I would say definitely I'm making time um, for what you enjoy. You know, for me, it's you know, surf and travel. So yeah. Super. Um, Norbert wants to know, uh, where is it? I've got to find it. Um, how do you like bounce back from a setback or like, for example, not swimming your best time or an injury, how, how, what would be your advice to be able to bounce back again, to come back better and stronger? Um, I'd loop back to the why again. I don't want to sound like a broken record, but I think staying with that doesn't change whether you're injured or anything else. You know, if you love swimming, you love swimming. Um, how, how do we bounce back? I mean, it's going to be different for everyone because all our mindsets are going to be different. Um, I've been to competitions where it's gone incredibly well. I've been to competitions where it hasn't gone incredibly well. Um, you know, one of my, I guess, most enjoyable moments um, of the sport uh, was actually Luke, who asked one of the questions earlier. Me and Luke were on a relay team when we were at university together. And we got a bronze medal at the British University Championships. Now, if anyone follows that, you know, the 50 freestyle is now won in 21 seconds. You know, to, to get anywhere near the podium was incredible. And a lot of people would go, a bronze medal, you know, you didn't get a silver or you didn't win. For me, that moment with that group of guys was absolutely incredible. Um, and it, it wasn't a winning achievement, if you like, but it was a group of guys that had really committed, trained together, you know, worked really hard. And actually the, the outcome of that, wasn't a win but actually for us it was a real win so that was something that um i just i guess reframe some of the, the those moments and actually that helps you bounce back from them but also manage them when they're good or bad because uh, i think it's really easy to get carried away when everything's going amazingly and think you're invincible and then on the flip side of that it's very easy to one race goes wrong out of 100 which will happen and then you think you're the worst swimmer in the world and you're going to walk away and everything's over and it's just saying well actually let's just keep things in perspective um, and, and that's helped me great um zara do you want to unmute yourself and you can ask a question oh uh, yeah um knowing what you know now if you could go back what would you change Oh, it's a great question. Um, what would I change? Um, I would not get caught up in too much of the chasing. And I don't mean this like don't chase qualifying events or medals and stuff like that. But I, I spent a lot of time, I guess, stressing and worrying about things that actually were pretty much out of my control. Um, I, I wish I'd spent probably more time focusing on the things that I could control. Um, some of the opportunities that I've had, um, I almost probably passed me by because I was so busy worrying about what was coming up, when was the next competition, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I probably had some wonderful moments in the pool and on land that actually I, I didn't appreciate as much as I could at the time. So, I mean, distilling it down to one thing, oh, one thing, what would it be? It's a really good question, actually. It's really, really stretching me. Um, I think I would probably spend less time rushing around and more time with people. And I learned that a lot more, I guess, now. We all notice as swimmers, as coaches, as parents, when we've not had all this stuff that we took for granted, how much we actually valued it. I'm never, ever going to complain about a, a timing pad breaking and me having to wait five minutes to dive in for my race. I'm never going to stress that it's raining and I have to huddle as a group coming out of Ponds Forge and it's pouring with rain and we're all trying to squeeze under one umbrella. You know, those little things um, I'm definitely going to appreciate a lot more. So I think, I, I don't know if that answers your question, but I think that's something that really kind of jumps out for me. And we've got one from Pipsy. Do you want to um, unmute yourself? Or if not, I can ask it for you. Uh yeah what separates the successful people from the rest well that is a wonderful question um i guess um something i guess that i've really picked up and i i would like to point out i've done 20 24 episodes of the podcast i've probably had the great privilege of meeting maybe 10 times the amount of people that i've managed to interview so uh I've come across a lot of very successful people in both sport, business, you know, whatever it is they do. And I think one of the things that I find with successful people is they're, they're very, as I mentioned earlier, they're very clear in their why. Um, they're very patient to get to that point. Um, and they have absolute belief in what they are doing. 
you know and i think oh, i'm just having a look through um uh, some of the, the, the you know katie ormerod you know snapped her snapped her ankle three days before competing at an olympic games after training her whole life she said like but i, I believe i'm going to get back i believe that i can get back to what i hope i'm going to achieve and touch with next year she does go on and get and get her olympic stardom that she's she's long overdue um i think one of the other things that and if you I'm not sure if you've got any basketball fans on here but um alan stein who i had the pleasure of interviewing in episode 21 a really interesting motivational speaker uh, and got to work with kobe bryant the basketball player that sadly passed away last year um, and he talked about this, this notion of the difference between the way people respond to situations. And I think that's something I would say separates successful people, not just in sport, but in life, is you can't control your context. You can't control where you're born. You can't control so many. You can't control the weather. Okay, You can't control whether there's a 50 meter pool on your doorstep. Not that you need one, but there's so many things in your life that you can't control. But what you can control is how you respond to those things. So, for example, Rebecca Adlington, when she won two Olympic golds and broke the world record in the 400 and 800 freestyle, did so training out of an eight lane, 25 meter pool half the time with the public. When Adam Peaty broke his world record and won his Olympic gold, he was training in a little club in Derby in a very, very old school pool. And if any of you have been there, it is a very old school pool my point being is that they chose to make the absolute best of what they had they didn't stress about what they didn't have or what they couldn't control so I, that would be i guess one thing for me that separates people that are really successful from the rest is that some people sit and whinge and i'm sure you've come across people in your life that actually you, they oh it's so unfair you know it's not my fault it's not my problem i can't do anything about it and then you have another group of people who go here's what i've got whatever it is and I'm going to make the absolute best of it. I'm going to take ownership over my journey, ownership over the tools that I have got, and I'm going to make the absolute best of it. And I think that's probably, if I'd have to boil it down to one thing, I would say how they respond to what they have instead of complaining about what they haven't. Great question, though. Thank you. Right, we've got one from, from Chris. So he wants to know with everything going with everything now going online, thanks to COVID, a lot of people have found the adjustment to online life difficult. Were you starting a podcast series? What challenges have you had to overcome in doing in, in going virtual? And what advice would you give to the rest of us? Great question. Um well, a, a little thing, I, I mean I had a, a, a quite a long conversation with one of your coaches this morning about this. And I think some of the aspects or some of the brilliant things we've had from this are here to stay and for good reason. So I would hope within, within a few years, if we have 25 swimmers on our Olympic team, every single week, one of those is on a Zoom call with athletes all around the country, inspiring them. Every single week, a coach is having a conversation on Zoom with another coach somewhere around the world. Every single month or every single three months, a group of parents get a chance to speak to an athlete or another parent or whatever it is some of the things that we're taking from this this period of covid we are going to keep and they're going to move things forwards they're going to be aspects that as you mentioned are very challenging and i think it comes down to a little bit around what makes you tick for me i love being outside that's kind of why surfing is one of my main passions i love being outdoors and in nature so i've found that listening to other people's podcasts whilst going out for a walk is really really good um, so I listen to the high performance podcast. That's probably my most staple podcast that I listen to. And, you know, those episodes range from half an hour to about an hour and a half. Um, and if I go for a walk, that's probably the kind of length of the walk that I go for. So I, I've found for me that really, really works because listening to it, I'm not on a screen. I'm outdoors. I'm getting fresh air, whatever it is. But I still get to do things that I really, really enjoy learning from others and their experiences. So that's something that's really benefited me. For everyone, you know, that's living on screens at the moment, what I would say is just try and make time every single day as much as possible to leave the house or at least get outside and get some fresh air. And I say that because you can go, you can feel like the house, the box becomes smaller and smaller every day that you spend indoors. Whereas actually, you know, get yourself outside, get a little bit of fresh air, listen to the birds tweeting, watch the sun coming up, feel the wind on your face. It does help. 
Um, but everyone's going to have different things that, that make them get fresh and, and help them. So um, it's a really good question, Chris. I think it's going to be different for everyone. But me personally, it's making sure I leave the house every day, listening to, to, you know, to somebody's podcast and hopefully learning a little bit every day so I feel like I'm moving forwards. Uh, great. Um, Matthew Money, do you want to unmute yourself? You can ask Kev next question. Um, due to like COVID and all that's happened like the last year, how do you think your view of swimming and like the sport will have changed once we go back to normal? What a great question that is. A um, couple of aspects there. <clears throat> I think in terms of my view towards it, it's, it's reinforced the fact that I absolutely love it. Uh, and <laughs> some things for that, like I'll happily sit and talk to athletes, coaches, parents, you know, all around the world, all the time about swimming. I love it. You know, it's who I am. So for me, actually, the, the, the lack of swimming has actually reinforced how much I enjoy swimming. I think the second thing is when we go back and how I might view it differently and what it might look like in terms of being different. Wonderful question. I guess we're not sure. But I do know one thing, the the way in which the sport has moved forwards, you know, for everyone that watched the ISL um, over the, the winter period when they were when that was running. Um, thank you. Um, you, you saw that a sport can run around the world, get people together digitally without crowds there and wherever you are in the world, you can watch it. I would imagine I know the club. Um, Cambridge, you guys did a, a virtual competition, I think, with with clubs from around the world. And I can see more of that sort of thing happening, um, which is really exciting. Um, and I think other than that, I can see a huge amount of innovation. I think this has all forced us to become more comfortable with technology, whether we like it or not. And I'm sure some of the opportunities that are going to come out of this, the different things that are going to happen, the new ideas, the new ways of doing things are going to be more now than we can ever possibly imagine. So I guess that's hopefully what's going to will come next. Some change, some new ideas, some fresh ideas, and hopefully some more exciting ideas because, hey, we all love exciting stuff. I don't think anyone, whether they went to the ISO in 2019 in London or watched it uh, on TV before Christmas, looked at it and thought, I wouldn't want to swim at that. Okay, it was exciting. It was cool. So I think I hope we see more and more of that sort of thing. All right, Tom, over to you. We've got. I think we've got last question from James. I don't know if he's going to unmute himself. I think he is. I will indeed. Um, yeah, just swimming specifically, Kev. Um, obviously, been in the sport a long time. What advice uh, would you give? a young Kev uh, or potentially the swimmers on this call that you sort of wish that maybe a coach or, or someone who'd been through the process had given you? Uh, there's a few things. Um, and I'll also flip that. I'll also give you a couple of pieces of advice that I was given. Um, first thing, I think, uh, enjoy whatever you're doing at the, the moment more. Um, you know, I don't know about you guys, but let's say I did a competition a month, been swimming 20 years. So what, 12, 20, 10, 240 competitions, maybe more across my career. I can tell you some of them. I can, can't can tell you, mm, I could probably tell you a couple of my PVs out of 24 or whatever there is. I can, I can't nail in. I can remember experiences though. Um, so some of the experiences you know, like I mentioned with, with Luke, who asked a question earlier, you know, uh, and getting that, that Bucks podium amongst many other things, I think jump out as me as experiences, but there were so many more that I wish I'd absorbed and enjoyed at, at that moment. One of my favorite swimming memories wasn't even me swimming. It was me watching one of my friends break a British record and going and giving him and then his parents a hug because I'd know how hard it was for him to get to that point. And actually that was, that was one of the things I guess um, in terms of, advice I was actually given that was really useful uh one of my old coaches Nick used to say to me there is always life outside of swimming and I don't mean we should all quit swimming quite the opposite but what uh, I guess it comes back to that keeping perspective thing and actually there's a much bigger world out there and swimming is part of that and try and keep it in perspective and the second thing was a coach that I've kept in touch with for 22 years now and um, he was the, the first coach I had um, and I so say I still see him and meet up with him when I can and he said to me, not long after I started, he said, young man, Rome wasn't built in a day. 
and that taught me quite early on to have, I guess, an element of patience in whatever I wanted to achieve. It was going to take uh, an amount of time to get there. And I think as that's kind of been reinforced by the, the people that I've spoke to on the podcast. So I guess those are the couple of bits of advice I was given, but also advice that I could give. Make sure you enjoy what you're doing in the moment, because like I say, we're all too aware now that actually we just wish we were back in the pool um, and everything else we'll worry about when we get there. <coughs> Got another one from Macy by the looks of it there, Tom. Yeah, I was going to say, do you want to unmute yourself, Macy, and you can ask this question? What are your best, what's like your best advice for keeping focus and having the right mindset to, to perform well um, during a hard set in training when the times are like challenging and it looks intimidating, like on the board? Yeah, I mean, I can, as I can remember, and I'm sure all of your coaches that swam can tell you all those sets that they looked at and went, oh, no, that looks awful. I'm not sure I can do that. So I think um, a couple of things that, that stuck with me. One, everyone's going to have a different way in which they focus. Um, and as I mentioned earlier about always finding the positives, if I see a set and I'm going to paint the worst case scenario, 40 100s, you know, and you look at it and go, oh, my God, 48 legs, that's so much work. You know, whatever it is, sorry, 40, 160 lengths that would be. Um, I would look at that and go, right, that's going to be tough. But what I could also look at it, I could say, hey, last year at the county championships, my streamlining wasn't that good. I'm about to do 160 lengths. That's 160 chances to get a brilliant push off. So I may not, you know, go 61 for 100 for all 40. You know, I may not even do that for one of them but I'm going to nail 160 world-class streamlines off the wall. I'm going to finish every single one, putting my hand on the wall with my head down in the last five meters. And if my coach has said, make sure you get your time on each one, when my hand touches the wall, I'm going to be looking up at the clock and getting my time. Okay. So I think it's trying to make sure that you find a positive aspect to everything. Cause sometimes you are going to find things that are hugely challenging. Some of the sets that I've watched Dan and Pete do over the years, I'm like, how can you do that? That's amazing. But then when you actually talk to him, he's like, I just focus on this little bit and try and get this bit as, as good as I can and everything else will take care of itself. So in terms of like keeping a, a good mindset, focusing on the small things, don't worry about the huge thing, just focus on the little things. Um, and I guess whatever the, the challenges you've got in your head, you can always flip it to find a positive um, because there will always be one. But great question. Thank you. It looks awesome. like we... I, I think, that's, say, yeah, I think that's the end of the questions. Is there anything else, guys? It's the, well, it's not the last chance because I said to the coaches this morning when I spoke to them, I'm more than happy to come back and talk about something completely different if you want to. And I think it would be really cool if any of you guys have got ideas on specific athletes, journeys or people that you'd like to hear about because that's what I do on the show. I kind of explore people's journeys. And that would be really, really cool at some point to come back. So maybe have a little think of people you'd like to know more about or sports you'd like to know more about or whatever it is. Um, and I'm more than happy to come back. But guys, thank you so much. There's been so many wonderful questions there. And it's been really enjoyable because I, I know your, your coaching team really well. They're a great group of guys, do a really, really good job. And I know the volunteers behind the scenes at the club have worked so hard to keep you guys engaged and involved during this very difficult last 12 months. So, you know, thank you to them for everything they're doing. Thank you to the coaches for, for inviting me in. And thank you so much to all the swimmers for, for being engaged today because it's, uh, it's nice to get out and see athletes, even if it's not in the chlorine environment that we're all used to. Uh, relating to what you said earlier about asking our swimmers to uh, maybe expand their knowledge, if you could pick maybe three podcasts that you've done or three podcasts that you would want to recommend our swimmers to listen to to maybe get some outside interest, maybe then come back again later with more questions, what would you recommend they listen to or look up or research? I think everyone's going to have their own interests. I cannot say there is a lack of podcasts out there. Um, yeah, you know, I've, done, I've had some really good times doing mine, but there are so many out there for swimmers. Um, you know, the, the Champions Mojo in America has interviewed some amazing ones. I listened to a fantastic interview with Michael Phelps and a swimmer probably a lot of you don't know, but called Grant Hackett. Um, that was absolutely fantastic. Um, what I'll do because there are so many and I save them all to my phone. I'm going to go through, I've already sent you Tom the presentation from today. So they'll have all the links and stuff in it, but I will send across to go out with that email every other one I can think of, or I've got saved because everyone's going to be different. 
but very often when you listen to one they talk about another one and quite a few of the people i've interviewed say oh check this one out check that one out and i've kind of collated a bit of a bank so yeah that that'd be quite a cool way of doing that i think and then at least it's all written down and then hopefully in six months when they go oh, i want a new podcast to listen to they can dig back on their emails and go from there sound good sounds great sounds perfect um yeah just huge thanks kev for coming on this evening i think everyone's found it just a bit of something different very interesting and some great knowledge you've got so really really appreciate it Awesome. Well, everyone, make sure, you know, give the, the Twitter and the, or the Instagram pages a follow. Have a look at some of the stuff I have put out because there's some pretty cool stuff coming up as well. Got some amazingly inspirational people over the next two seasons and there's so many episodes already out there. And just have a look through. Like I try and do a little, I mean, on my website, I've put like a little bio underneath each episode. So you can actually read a little bit about it before you even get into it and kind of go, oh, that might be for me or it might not be for me and um, but there, i mean there, there are some swimming ones on there for anyone who's a bit of a enjoys their twitter there's a, a guy called kyle sockwell who's quite a twitter famous swimmer he was one of phelps's training partners for his last olympics uh, we recorded an episode a couple of weeks ago and that's going out i think in three weeks time so keep an eye out for that because that is one of the most swimming centric discussions we've ever had talking about the journey of a swimmer and how awesome it was training under bob bowman and all those sorts of things so i'm sure the swimmers will enjoy that one um, but yeah thank you so much for the invite and have a wonderful evening everyone cheers kev really appreciate it, mate top work all right. Have See a great one, everyone. Thanks for joining Thanks us. Thanks very much. If you want to hang around at the end, you can ask a question yourself to Kev. I'm sure he'll happily answer any people that wants to hang around at all. Yeah, I'll, st I'll stay on. Um, I'm just going to stop sharing my screen so I can see everybody. Um, but yeah, I'll stay on for a bit. Happy to have a chit chat. I've been refueled on my water supplies. So. <laughs> Anyone going to be brave and unmute themselves and ask any questions? Or is everyone going to run for the hills and go, I want my dinner? Have you got a question there, Francesco? You can type it if you want to. I'll, I'll really open the chat box. Oh, he was, was fighting with dog. his dog. Okay. <laughs> Has your dog got a question? <laughs> Who's winning? <laughs>